Hey, Johnny here, and today I'm building a record cabinet with a sliding wooden rolling door made from a single $1,200 eight foot slab of walnut. And to make it really unique, I'll be carving in a 3D pattern into the 109 strips of wood on the rolling door, which creates a unique effect on the edge of the cabinet that looks like wood flowing like water. I'm building this record cabinet for a client, and while the door is made from a single slab of locally sourced black walnut, the cabinet itself is gonna be made from dimensional walnut boards. And as I get these boards cut to size and milled up, I wanna talk about the main feature of this piece. Now, I've built rolling wooden doors on a few projects. These doors are actually called tambour, but that seems like a more obscure term. So if during this video I talk about tambour or rolling wooden doors, know that I'm referring to the exact same thing. Even if someone tries to correct you and say, oh, it has to be called tambour, I assure you, rolling wood is an acceptable name. And this kind of reminds me of a guy I knew in high school named Seth. Seth was one of those, well, actually guys. And I know you all know the type. They're extremely prolific on the internet. Like if someone back in school said they had a gyro sandwich for lunch, Seth would interject, well, actually, it's pronounced gyro. And while the pronunciation is probably closer to gyro than gyro, also, who cares? You know what I wanna eat. Or I remember one time in math class, a couple of guys were arguing over who owned a particular calculator. One guy said it was his. The other guy said, that's mine. You stole it from me. Then Seth butts in. Well, actually, possession is nine-tenths of the law, which I guess that means that if you have the thing, it's yours. But when you think about that sentence, it makes no sense. I mean, when did we ever break down laws into fractions? Like he four-tenths killed that guy, so I guess they didn't charge him. And I spent over 13 years of my life investigating burglaries of property, and we would have some Seth tell us, well, actually, possession is nine-tenths of the law. My response was always, well, what's the other tenth? Unfortunately, these Seths could never answer. So if you wanna call it tambour or call it rolling wooden door, it doesn't matter to me. Just don't be a well actually guy. Don't be a Seth. So all the tambour doors that I've done in the past have been flat panels. And the first one I built, I didn't even care about matching the grain. Whereas the second tambour door I built was all from a single board. I numbered all the pieces and had matching grain across the door. And that looked really good, but I started thinking about what the next evolution of rolling wooden doors is. And for me, that's adding in a 3D carved design onto the door to play along with the continuous grain. And then that sort of door is gonna look really interesting as it's pulled around the edges of the cabinet. So that's the entire inspiration for this piece, to create a timbre cabinet that looks like nothing else I've ever seen. But before I can get to building the door, I need to glue up panels for the top and bottom of the cabinet and the dividers inside the cabinet. There are seven dividers inside the cabinet for record storage, and the client wanted lots of storage for the record collection as it's grown too large for their previous record cabinet. And with these seven dividers, you'll never see them once this cabinet is loaded up with albums and in use. But regardless, I wanted to make book match glue up, so I have to resaw these walnut blocks to get two pieces for each panel with matching grain. Again, this is totally hidden and unnecessary, but I think it's a nice touch. Sort of like a little Easter egg or a hidden Mickey on this build. And speaking of Easter eggs, I'm gonna hide a little Easter egg somewhere in the remainder of this video. So if you're the first one to spot it and leave a comment with a timestamp and what it is, I'll send you a free Johnny Builds t-shirt. And I think little hidden details like book matching dividers help elevate the overall finish of a piece. Or at least it's good marketing to say something like, oh, this cabinet has custom bespoke black walnut book match panels with a 3D design baffled relief cutout with a mid-century modern flair. And the client just hears all those buzzwords and thinks, oh yeah, this is a really nice piece. This guy really knows his stuff. To cut out the dividers as well as the pattern, I put all seven panels on my CNC to cut out and right away the machine knocked the first panel loose. It gouged up the front, but I'm pretty sure I can fix this later on, hopefully. As predicted, cleaning up the mistake wasn't too difficult, nothing that a little band saw, and the router table couldn't fix. I then planed all the dividers down to their final thickness and could start to tackle the top panel, bottom panel, and the back panel. Now, one issue I had was not having enough clamps. I essentially had to glue up each panel one at a time, and since they're basically all the same, I'm just gonna show you this process once and spare you the monotony of what it was like doing this three times in a row. So you guys know I'm not much of a hand tool woodworker, but my wife, Katie, she got me this really nice set of Veritas hand planes. And I spent a good amount of time yesterday 
getting the blades sharpened and getting them dialed in. And I'm excited to actually use them to clean up this panel. Now, I'm not gonna do uh, the mortal sin of cleaning up this glue squeeze out with one of these really nice hand planes. I'm gonna sand it off, but there is some clean out that I need to do and I get to use these bad boys. That should be pretty fun. It's already getting rust on it. That's why I can't have nice things. The more I use digital manufacturing tools and 3D modeling to design and build my projects, the more satisfying it is to pick up some hand tools and do some old school woodworking. Not that one is better than the other, more it's just a different experience. And I think it's sort of similar to the resurgence in vinyl records, which let's not forget is the reason that I'm even making this project. I mean, audiophiles will say it's the best sound. I don't have that sort of ear, nor the equipment, nor the desire to spend the kind of money it takes to get the best equipment. For me, it's more about the enjoyment of listening to an album as it was intended versus just randomly playing songs on Spotify. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that and listening to a bunch of songs randomly. That's mostly how I consume my tunes, but there is something a little nostalgic, a little special about listening to a record start to finish. And it's not just listening to all the songs in their intended order either. It's about how listening to a record forces you to slow down and actually enjoy the music. And I think there's a similar vibe in using hand tools. And just like a true audiophile would probably lose their mind if they saw how I sometimes store my records or play them even when they're dusty, a true hand tool woodworker is probably watching me attempt to smooth this panel and seeing all the things that I'm doing wrong here. But hey, you have to start somewhere and I hope to only get better and learn more and just figuring out more stuff about using hand tools. Now what you've been watching me work on here are the top and bottom panels for the cabinet. And now that the glue is dry and they're plain flat, I can put them over on the CNC to cut out all the dados for the dividers and the back panel, as well as cut the profile of the cabinet out. So like I mentioned, this record cabinet has seven dividers creating eight spots to store records. The rolling doors are pushed all the way out to the very edge of the cabinet profile. And to take advantage of the extra space on each end, I'm gonna put in five quarter inch brass dowels. Now this allows the two end slots to be usable for record storage because without this, the records would fall against the timbre door, potentially making the doors not work or damaging the records. Maybe at this point, none of what I said makes any sense, but I promise you as you watch the cabinet come together, it will. And while I sand and clean up the panels, I wanna say thanks for all your support. You all seem to really love my new t-shirt designs and I really appreciate everyone who has ordered a shirt. Some of you may have noticed that I actually cut back on the sponsors in my videos and I haven't been doing any ad reads. And this is because I got a bunch of comments telling me that my videos are just like one big ad. And on that particular video, I rewatched it and I couldn't dispute that claim. In order to make better videos, I've cut way back on the sponsorships in these videos. So when you guys buy my shirts, it really does help keep the lights on here at Johnny Builds. And I truly appreciate that. I'm really proud of my two newest shirts the tattoo version of the Wing It shirt and the Maker shirt. So if you feel inclined to support what I do, buying my merch is a great way to do that and I truly appreciate all of you. The other way to support what I do that costs you zero is to get subscribed, but I've gotta be honest here. I only want you to subscribe if you truly enjoy what I'm doing. My goofy dad jokes and watching me fumble my way through building what sometimes turns out to be some pretty interesting projects. So if that's you, please gently tap the subscribe button turn on notifications so you don't miss the next video and check out my links down below that also help support what I do. I feel like I have one of the best, most knowledgeable subscriber bases on YouTube. At every single video, I learn valuable information from all of you that I actually use. So I just wanna say thanks. And there are a few well actually sess in the comment section, but for the most part, you folks are amazing. I wish I could give each and every one of you a great big hug, but unfortunately various laws throughout the country prevent me from doing so. It's time to build the timbre doors. So I headed over to my favorite lumber supplier here in Oklahoma City. And for the last six plus years, that has been vintage reclaimed lumber. They've got tons of unique wood slabs and reclaimed wood. And if you're in the area and you drop by and tell them Johnny sent you, you'll get 10% off of your order. And if you're buying a $1,295 slab at VRL, 10% off is, well, it's like a lot of money, trust me. I don't know the exact amount because someone stole my calculator when I was in high school. Yeah, the kid in that story, that was me. 
So anyway, I picked out this eight foot black walnut slab sourced right here in Oklahoma. This slab has been kiln dried in their vacuum kiln before being set back outside to reacclimate. And my meter is reading between 10 and 12% moisture content, which is right where you wanna be in this climate. As the flattening bit reveals the grain pattern, there isn't really anything truly unique about this slab, but it does have very nice straight grain, consistent color, and a few cracks and knots that I will need to fill with epoxy. And while I thought an eight foot slab was gonna be enough, this cut it really close as you're gonna see later on. I'm gonna slice this slab up into three quarter inch strips and while I'm confident this is gonna look really good in the end, it does feel like a mortal woodworking sin to cut this beautiful slab up into over a hundred pieces. I'm filling all these knot holes using Total Boat Thick Set Epoxy. Lately, I've been using India ink to pigment my epoxy, and this has become my favorite way to do this. One, it's really cost effective compared to other pigments, and two, I can really dial in just how black I want to attempt the epoxy. Also, you guys know that Total Boat has been a longtime sponsor of mine. I've been using their products for years, and I stand by them as the best epoxy and the best finishes on the market. And if you wanna check out any of Total Boat's products, I've got a link for you down below in the description, and that's gonna get you a discount every time you shop at totalboat.com. After sanding the epoxy, I still have a few small holes to fill, and this time I'm gonna use some black CA glue to fill those in. This stuff flows pretty well, but a little pick like this helps it get down in all those voids. And once it's had a chance to settle, I come back and hit it with the activator. After flattening to an inch and a half, it's almost time to start ripping the slab into what ended up being over a hundred wood strips for the tambour. But trying to do that with a full eight foot long slab would be extremely difficult just because of how heavy it would be. So I'm gonna rip this slab in half into two four foot sections using my track saw first. Coming off the CNC, I cut the slab to 20 inches wide, but the tambour strips are 13 and a half inches tall. But I'm trying here to get the best looking section of the slab. So first I'm gonna cut off an inch from one side, then I'll flip these over and cut off the remaining width to get the slab down to 13.5 inches before cutting the tambour. And I know I keep calling these slabs, I guess they're not really slabs anymore. At this point, they're really just wide dimensional six quarter walnut boards. Now, again, I thought eight foot was gonna be enough to wrap around this cabinet, but I really only had 92 inches of usable wood after getting it flattened and cut in half. And the more narrow I cut the strips, the more cuts I have to make. And every cut, you're losing the width of the saw blade, which is typically an eighth of an inch. So here I'm gonna switch to a thin kerf blade, which is even more narrow. An eighth of an inch is 0.125 inch, while this blade is a little bit smaller at 0.09 inches. And with that thin blade cutting the strips to three quarters of an inch, that should give me exactly enough material for the tambour doors to wrap around the back of the cabinet. Ideally, I would have cut these into half inch strips or even more narrow than that. And the more narrow the strip is, the more dramatic the effect is as the tambour is pulled around the edges of the cabinet. This is gonna make more sense later on, but just know I'm cutting it really close here. I did rig up this little system to cut all the strips, which consisted of my Rockler crosscut sled, an Izzy Swan in-feed extension, and then I screwed this stop block into the drop-off platform. And this allows me to cut consistent three-quarter inch wide strips while also making this cut safely. And then it's just repeat that cut 108 more times while keeping everything in order to maintain the continuous grain pattern. As I number the pieces here, it reminded me of another Seth moment from high school. We're sitting in geometry class and the normal teacher had been out for a few weeks. They had different teachers and subs filling in during this time. And I remember on this particular day, one of the football coaches was filling in. Now, mind you, this coach, and I'm not gonna say his name just in case someone actually knows who I'm talking about, but this coach is doing his dead level best to fill in. He's just reading the book and having us work on the worksheets, totally just winging it the whole time. And you could tell geometry was not his subject. This coach lived and breathed football and not so much finding the hypotenuse of a triangle. So coach is just reading from the book and he's talking about the Pythagorean theorem, but he says Pythogonarian. 
Now, most of the class, we looked at each other, we kind of chuckled, but we knew what he was trying to say, and we knew best to keep our mouth shut, but not Seth. He pipes up from the back. Well, actually, Coach, it's Pythagorean theorem. All Coach said was, thank you, Seth, and kept right on going. And you're probably thinking, Johnny, this has nothing to do with this project. What the heck are you talking about? Well, actually, it does. When I first started making projects like this, I probably knew as much about woodworking as that sweet old coach knew about the Pythogonarian theorem. And the important thing is, is that there's something that I wanted to do, this channel. So I showed up, I gave it my all, and a lot of times it wasn't pretty or perfect. And I could admit that it never will be perfect because perfection is untenable. In my opinion, it's not even really worth striving for. And before you say, well, actually, just hear me out. Perfection isn't worth striving for because it's almost impossible to achieve. And I'm definitely not the first one to say this, but choose progress over perfection. And in that sense, you're always trying to get better, always trying to reach for the next level, but also giving yourself space to screw up space to pronounce a word wrong or make a mistake that other people can see because there's really a lot of power in not caring about what other people think or better yet, not allowing what other people think to guide the choices that you make. That's my little coach pep talk or my public service announcement for this video. Learn from your mistakes. Go for progress rather than perfection because if you do, you can't lose. Okay, so you just saw me build the jig that I'll use to lock all the wood strips together, but before I can put this on the CNC to carve that 3D pattern, I have to put the canvas back on first. All right, so we've got all those tambour strips in this little jig that I made, so we can put canvas on the back, turn this from a bunch of strips of wood into a tambour door. Seriously, all I'm using is just some basic ass Home Depot canvas drop cloth. That's all you need and wood glue. So on my desk video, someone uh, watched it. They left a comment that I should have used pinking shears to cut the canvas because when you cut it with pinking shears, it will make it to where it doesn't fray. So we went out and got some pinking shears, which are these special scissors that kind of have this zigzag pattern. I remember playing with these as a kid and cutting some paper because I thought it was cool and I got in trouble because you're not supposed to use them on paper. It was for fabric only. Now I got my own pinking shears and I can cut whatever I want. And the first thing I'm gonna cut is this canvas. Surprisingly, all you need to attach canvas to the wood strips is basic wood glue. But you really want those wood strips to be packed together as tightly as possible, which this jig that I built helps me do. The tighter it is, the less glue that will squeeze down between the wood strips, meaning less cleanup later on. Now I'm gonna let that sit for now, but I do need to come back in an hour to an hour and a half and pull apart every strip and then clean out any squeeze out to prevent gluing some of the tambour strips together. And being an inch and a half thick at this point, this timbre is much more heavy. So I had to be extra careful about pulling these pieces apart without pulling the whole strip off. But once that glue is dry and I know nothing is gonna stick together, I can put this back on the CNC to begin those carves. So that means back into that jig that I built, but this time the strips are facing up where that 3D pattern is gonna get carved into the face. Now you saw me carve the plywood test panel earlier and that didn't go super great. It wasn't bad, but I did go back into the G-code and make a few tweaks, and this should make the carves go smoother. The machine is gonna do these carves in two passes. The first pass is a roughing pass, which is meant to remove as much material as possible, and I'm gonna do this with a half-inch end mill. I'm nervous for this one. <laughs> okay, here we go. And this time you can see that the roughing pass is moving from left to right, clearing materials from the front of the panel to the back, which to me seems much more efficient than the original G-code that I had running horizontally. And that I call progress. And this was a really stressful carve. On every project, there's some build process or two that if something goes wrong, the whole project is screwed. And here I'd ruin a $1,200 slab of wood and essentially have to start the whole project over. And I'm happy to say these carves went perfectly. And they're just really cool to watch. I did leave the dust collection off, mostly because these carves are so mesmerizing to watch, but also because it does allow me to monitor the tool pass and then catch any errors right away and I can stop the machine, but mostly because it looks awesome. The downside is that I'll be sweeping up walnut sawdust for weeks, maybe months, maybe the rest of the year, but it was totally worth it. 
That is so cool. The way I design is I get the larger overall look of the piece figured out and then sort of wing it on some of the other smaller details like the door pulls. And I had a really hard time with this one. Ideally, the door pulls would have been directly integrated into the walnut doors. And I wanted to carve in a recess to accomplish this, but then I realized that recess would span several slats, meaning you would pinch your fingers every single time you close the doors. So this is my solution. Because of all the continuous grain, I needed to go with a contrasting wood species, and I really love the look of Purple Heart and Walnut together. Now, this was not a perfect solution, and if I ever built something like this again, I would take a little bit more time to focus on the pulls. You'll see what I mean here in a bit, but after I get the profile cut on the bandsaw, I do have a bit of cleanup to do. The top half of the pull gets attached to the left door, while the lower pull gets attached to the right door. When the door is fully closed, that Purple Heart pull will be in perfect alignment and it's just gonna look like one single piece of contrasting wood. The last piece I need to build is the cabinet base and I'm gonna keep that fairly simple with a bit of mid-century modern styling. And by simple, I mean this will mostly be cut out on the CNC. Also, I'm using the offcuts from the slab that I use for the timbre door slats. So being that that's mostly what you see looking at this cabinet straight on, I thought having the base made out of the same piece of wood would be a really nice touch. Now this is probably something most folks would notice, but if you're doing client work, this is just another way to elevate the piece and potentially sell your pieces for even more money. Also, I usually have issues with tear out on the CNC with little parts like these, so I made them a little bit longer and then I'll cut them the final length over on the table saw. The whole base gets assembled with dominoes and wood glue. And as I put together the rest of the base, let me tell you about the bonus build that I'm working on for this piece. It's a little speakeasy bar in a box that fits into one of the record cabinet cubbies inside. I've got most of that box built, but we sort of realized that we've already got way too many things to cover in this video to show the box build. But I do plan on finishing that piece. It's gonna hold a bottle of bourbon and a couple whiskey glasses. It also has a little skeleton key to unlock the box. I think it's a super cool little project. Again, it's too much for this particular video, but if you guys do wanna see that build, let me know in the comments. I'm actually considering releasing the project on my second channel, the Johnny Bills Offcuts channel. So if there's enough support for that, I'll make that happen. Also, make sure you get subscribed to Johnny Bills Offcuts. I'm working on some longer anthology videos highlighting multiple builds. These are gonna be super fun, but also super long probably two plus hours. So it's taking extra long to get these put together, but it'll essentially be some of the projects that you've seen, but then reimagined with new voiceover, more insider details and updates on how I do things different now. Plus I'll be dropping more reels and anything else that doesn't go on my main channel over on the Johnny Bills Offcuts channel. So if that's of interest to you guys, then I've got a link for you down below. And I really appreciate everyone that has subscribed so far. Those 3D carves on the rolling doors came out so good, but that half inch ball nose does leave a fairly rough surface that needs to be sanded a little bit. And by a little bit, I'm talking about hours of sanding. The texture on the door makes it difficult to get down in all the little valleys. And this took way longer than I thought. This was about six hours of sanding condensed into 20 seconds. And then I can start sanding in between the slats. After sanding everything up to 180 grit, the whole cabinet is getting a coat of Rubio Monocoat to finish, and finishing the doors took forever as I need to rub the finish between all 109 slats and then come back and buff that away between all 109 slats. But damn, those doors look amazing. This build has taken much longer than I anticipated to finish, so not only am I completely over it and ready to start the next build, I'm also really excited to see this thing all put together and functional. I've mentioned that this cabinet is a client build a couple times now, and I want to reveal right now that that client is me. Well, actually, me, my wife, my daughters, my whole family. This record cabinet will live in our brand new house for years to come. And let me tell you, the client is extremely happy with the way this is turning out. Before I can assemble the cabinet, I have to clean up the curved corners on all the dados. These are left behind by the quarter inch router bits that I used to carve this over on the CNC. And of course I need to clean up both the top and bottom panels, which are exactly the same. If you remember when I first carved these dividers, the CNC knocked that first panel loose and gouged that curved edge. 
I can get that cleaned up over here on the drum sander and using the router. And by the time I was done, you could hardly tell that it even happened. Plus I put that panel towards the edge of the cabinet where it'll be even less visible. The interior of the cabinet will be pretty difficult to add finish once this piece is assembled. So I'm gonna pre-finish as many parts as possible before I glue it up. Tipping off the ends like this keeps the finish off the parts of these dividers that slot down into the dados. I'm doing it this way so the glue has a chance to attach to the panels properly. And once everything is glued and assembled, I can go back in and add finish where it's needed. All the dividers got a very slight round over and I'm adding that same profile to the top and bottom panels as well. I decided to do a very subtle round over on the top and bottom and I feel like it's just enough to soften this piece without removing too much material. And right here I'm adding finish to these top and bottom panels only on the inside for now. I'm gonna hold off on finishing the outside of the top and bottom panels because all that moving around and flipping this piece over as I finish the rest of the build, it's just gonna further scratch up those surfaces. These quarter inch brass rods close off the ends of the cubbies and I need to cut them to the same height as those dividers. I'm using a tiny bit of Total Boat four minute epoxy to fix these in place. And to make the final glue ups go as smoothly as possible, I won't epoxy them into the top panel because these aren't structural in any way. And same as the brass rods, I'm gonna glue the dividers into the bottom panel first. However, the middle dividers will get glued into the top because they are 100% structural. I knew this glue up wasn't gonna be easy, but this was probably the most stressful glue up that I've done to date, given there are 10 brass rods, seven dividers, and the back panel that all have to line up perfectly for the cabinet to come together. I even tried to place in the tamper doors during the glue up, but immediately realized this was not possible. Also meaning that I'm gonna have to figure out how to get the doors in after the fact. Now I've seen some other tambour builds where they integrate an entry slot into the back in order to slide in the tambour pieces after it's been assembled. So without thinking about it too much, I figured I could just cut in a three inch slot and this is gonna allow me to just slide the doors in the back. My first mistake here was obviously not thinking about it too much because as you can see, trying to fit a four foot long tambour panel into this tiny little cut was a terribly flawed idea. So I essentially screwed the pooch here. The other tambour projects that I've done, I've been able to glue them up with a tambour in place, which is not how people typically do it. Typically they cut an entry groove, glue everything up, and then put the tambour in. So during the glue up, it wasn't going well. We ripped the tambour out of there, we just glued it up as is, and it ended up going really well. But now I tried to cut that entry rabbit, dado, whatever you wanna call it, and this is too thick to get into the groove. At this angle, it's just a solid board. You know, it's only, has flex going this way. Basically, unless I just cut this whole back piece off, I'm not gonna be able to get it in. So that's essentially what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take it over to the table saw, cut off, maybe to right here where I've already cut and see if I can get it in then. And then I'll have to take uh, strips of wood and come back and like repair what I'm about to tear up. So cutting off the back edges of this piece seems a little extreme at this point, but I was desperate and this was by far the best solution I could think of. And given how awkward this cabinet was to hold at this point, I needed Andy's help to push it up against the table saw fence while I pushed it through and made the cuts. I thought the first glue up was stressful, but this put that to shame. Now, I mentioned earlier how every build has a moment where things could go sideways and the whole project would be ruined. I feel like this build had about a dozen of those moments. Lopping off the back of the cabinet to get those doors installed was such a classic Johnny Builds wing it move, and thankfully, it worked out really well. So that wasn't the most elegant of solutions, but it actually worked really well. We were able to get the doors in. They're sliding great, but now I'm left with having to clean up the spot that I cut off and glue on a new piece. I'm pretty sure I can use this as a template to make the new pieces. Also, I've got some offcuts left over from carving these so I can use the exact same wood to make the two new pieces that I need to make. And again, if I'm being honest with you guys, I am completely over this project at this point. I can see that finish line in sight and I just wanna get this done because it's taken me way longer than I anticipated to build this piece. But even so, figuring out little solutions like this are one of my favorite parts of building these projects. And I've said it before and I'll say it now, for me, the heart of woodworking or just really making in general is all about problem solving. 
When things go well, it's pretty easy, but when does anything ever go well 100% of the time? I've come to realize that when you screw up as often as I do, figuring out how to fix those mistakes is really fun. Super stressful, but fun. There's a little spot left over from where the table saw blade made entry, but overall it looks really good. And since the back of the cabinet sits against the wall, no one will ever likely notice. And I know I've said that I'm over this build, but with the end in sight, now I've got my second wind and I'm really excited to finish this up. I do need to add Rubio Monaco to the top and bottom of the cabinet, as well as clean up all those little spots inside that I had taped off earlier. And I just did those parts off camera. To attach the base, I'm using these figure eight fasteners. These are probably the easiest technique to attach a base like this. And that figure eight design allows the fasteners to move with seasonal wood movement while staying tightly attached. And with that, this cabinet was done. I can't describe how cool this looks in person as that 3D wood slap flows around the edge of the cabinet. It's almost like making wood flow like water. And before you go, I wanted to give you a quick little update on my old pal, Seth. I ran into him about a year ago and we had a chance to catch up. And turns out, Seth is a lovely human being. And not one time during our conversation did he well actually me. Proving Seth has made a lot of progress since high school. But he's not perfect. He did admit he's a Bruce Springsteen fan. Cheers, man. Ooh. I'm not a big whiskey guy, but that's, that's pretty good. Well, actually, that's bourbon, meaning it has to be at least 51% corn mash. It has to be produced in the U.S., most of the time in Kentucky. It has to be aged for two years in newly charred oak barrels. It can't be higher than 160 proof. It can't be lower than 80 proof. You can't add any other additives except for water. Like, All right, thanks for watching bourbon. and yes. comment, well, actually, if you watch to the end.